Hello there, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to go and start uh, in a couple minutes. The keynotes went just a tiny bit long. So we want to make sure that people have time to join. Um, and of course, the first couple slides are just um, uh, brief introductions. So even then, um, I'm not saying they're not uh, worthwhile, but uh, they're not really the meat of the presentation. So we'll give it maybe another one or two minutes. And, uh, and start that. I do see some people trickling in. I've got it as a 17 past the hour. Um, but let's go ahead. Let's start. We've got uh, a lot of good detail to, uh, to go into. And as I said before, the first few slides are things that I think people will be able to, uh, uh, to really uh, go through quickly. So uh, Nick, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and start off, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks, Jim. So I'm Nick Vidal. I have my personal timeline. I'll be sharing that uh, a little later. Uh, but I'm really happy to be part of this. I love everything about open source. And I, I got to love about the history of open source as well. And uh, it's very interesting to see that the HTTP server is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. I'm glad that Jim accepted my invitation to talk about this. And it's super interesting here. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Jim Jagelski here. Uh, we can go to the, uh, the slide. So, uh, uh, Nick, if you want to uh, flip that over. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for attending. I do see that in, uh, in conflict with this session, is actually an Nginx session. So thank you for everyone here, uh, all the true believers, keeping the uh, the Apache HTTP <laughs> server torch uh, alive. Um, uh, a little bit about my about myself. Um, you know, there was a uh, not quite one of the original uh, eight members, but part of the uh, the Apache group that actually created the Apache uh, Software Foundation in 1999. Uh, since then, I've been on the board for, for many, many, many years and have worn a number of different hats in the Apache Software Foundation, as well as uh, other uh, open source organizations as well, including uh, a board director for the Open Source uh, Initiative. Uh, in 2020, I'm really, and yes, Daniel says a master brewer, and that is, uh, that is correct. I have taken mm -hmm. up a home brewing uh, and enjoying that quite a bit. Maybe I'll try to do a session or birds of feather on that later on. And um, this year, I actually joined Uber as their open source program office lead. So I have a lot of history, a lot of background with uh, HTTPD. In fact, uh, that was the thing that has really been a, a career and life changer for me. So uh, Apache and the ASF's history uh, really has influenced mine. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about timelines here, I'll just go really my time, my personal source. Uh, first open source community was Drupal uh, when I actually started uh, as an app of the Drupal community. That was back in 2007. In 2011, I'm, I'm from Brazil, so 
book camp there. Uh, and we invited Pris Betayart, who is the founder of the Drupal uh, community. And he joined us for the first time in Latin America. And uh, finally, in 2015, the OSI, the Open Source Initiative, uh, they were looking for a volunteer websites. And it's on Drupal, they called me. Uh, and I helped them to, to own. And in 2017, we started working years of open source started on, on looking back on, on history, on how they emerge, how they evolve. And it was a really awesome experience. And I wanted to continue that, exploring how other open source projects and communities, how they, how they started. And so in 2018, we started years of open source. So, uh, the overview of our talk today, uh, I want to tell you about the motivation, why it's important to look back on history. What were the reasons and up were happening? And finally, Jim will be talking about the timeline of how the project got started and how the got started as well. And next, I talk about some. Let's jump. Hey, Nick. So what's the uh, before you behind this, Nick. Before you start, um, uh, we're getting some a little bit of an audio issue. I was wondering if maybe you might be bandwidth constricted. Mm -hmm. Maybe try uh, pausing your video and see if that helps out a little bit. Okay, perfect. So let me try that. No, that's much better. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, great, perfect. So what's the motivation behind this? Uh, I think anniversaries are much more than just throwing a party, you know? Uh, when we celebrate the 20 years of open source, there are, we helped organize over 100 activities across 40 events worldwide. It was really interesting. And uh, while we, we did celebrate throwing several parties, having cupcakes, allowing people to have a good time and to talk. It's more than just that. Um, I think what's so, how we can look back in history of an open source project, of a, of a community, and see, and it's to re evaluate the mission and the values of that community. And not just look back, but also look forward towards a new future. What we want to change, what changes we want to bring in, and what we want to continue. And that's what I think it's what's so motivating about talking about uh, anniversaries. And so um, it's quite interesting because uh, I helped organize together with the, uh, the director, the OSI member of directors, uh, the 20 years of open source in 2018. Last year, we had a lot of uh, a lot of anniversaries, uh, and the Apache was celebrating their 20th anniversary, and that was really interesting. And the World Wide Web was also celebrating their 30th anniversary. So these are two very important foundations, two very important uh, consortiums that were celebrating their anniversary and looking back on their history. And this year, well, this year was, uh, you know, it's very complicated, um, especially because of the coronavirus. But it's important to highlight several projects that are celebrating their anniversary. And so we're celebrating 25 years of Java and JavaScript. And we're also celebrating 25 years of the LAMP stack. Uh, and next year, we'll be celebrating 30 years of Linux. So let's look at the timeline here uh, to see how interesting it is and how this movement grew 20 to 30 years ago. So the World Wide Web was born in 1989, and this certainly has had a major impact on the whole society. 
And in 91, Linux was born. Uh, Linux said well, it, was, it was just a hobby project at the time, but it grew really fast in terms of popularity. And finally, 25 years ago, all pieces came together. We had the Apache, of course. Uh, Jim will be able to talk a bit about the history behind that uh, in a short. But Apache uh, came in uh, as an open source project as well. MySQL was released as well as open source in 1995. PHP, uh, Rasmus was also launching PHP in 1995. And of course, on the client side, we have JavaScript, uh, Brandon um, working together with Netscape, uh, now Mozilla, he developed JavaScript. So everything was coming together. And what's most interesting is that everything uh, there was open source and we finally had the LAMP stack. And the reason why that's so important is uh, because it, it wouldn't be, uh, if it weren't open source, Perhaps we wouldn't have the web as we know it today. Everything would be proprietary and it would be very complicated. Innovation wouldn't be as great. So it's really interesting that everything came together at this period of time. 25 to 30 years ago, it was a really interesting time and it really helped open source uh, to have a foothold on history and really grow from there. So uh, we re really need to have to look back at that time and see what we got right and what we want to change. And of course, in 1998, the Open Source Initiative was founded and open source at the time, of course, grew from the free software movements and open source just had a, a different messaging that was more appealing for business to adopt free software and this has completely changed the whole industry and the web uh, as we know it's grew from open source and it was really important uh, there so uh, i'll pass now to jim uh, who will be able to share the timeline here uh, jim uh, i'll be opening the timeline here and sharing with okay. you, but go ahead. Okay, please. you got it. Thank you very much. I want to see if I can also share it on my screen uh, as well. I should be able to, so let's see if that works. Uh, you should be seeing the uh, screen right now as it is. Uh, kudos to uh, to Nick for, for drafting this. This is incredibly, uh, incredibly beautiful. Um, so I just want to, again, thank, uh, thank Nick for doing that. Um, are you seeing my screen? Let me just scroll. I'm scrolling down. Can you see that? Or are you seeing Nick's? Okay, that one's okay. Perfect. Cool. Okay, so now you can see mine. Let, let's swing that. <laughs> so uh, let's start at the very, very beginning. In fact, let's start even before the beginning. And because I feel a little bit like Gandalf telling Frodo about the, uh, the story of the ring, I will be using a, uh, a wizard pipe. As I as I give you all the story of uh, of the feather, um, you know, back in the early '90s when the web was just created, um, even before the NCSA web server, there was this web server from uh, from CERN, and that was the one that really really uh, came about and really made people realize the potential uh, of the uh, of the web out there. Now, um, but it really didn't take. Uh, big impact until there was the NCSA web server, HTTPD. And of course, one of the reasons behind it is because NCSA was also the people who were doing Mosaic, the web browser. So really with one entity, you had the browser and the server, the server and the client. Um, and it really showed everyone the potential of, uh, of the web. And a lot of people, uh, myself included, but also basically all the people who were parts of the uh, Apache group at the very start, um, we built businesses, you know, or services or some kind of capability around the NCSA web server. And Rob McCool was, uh, was basically the main architect uh, behind that. Now, what happened when Mosaic uh, Communications Corporation or Netscape 
uh, came about is that Nick left. And so we had this, uh, this web server that we were all really, really super dependent upon, but uh, development had basically been stalled. Um, almost no one was keeping up on it. Uh, and for a long period of time, it just stagnated. Uh, and that was a very, very difficult thing to, to handle because they said before, there were a lot of people really, really dependent upon it. Now, it was very, very fortunate at that period of time is that there were a group of, uh, of eight people who were able to bootstrap a community around it, uh, called themselves the, uh, the Apache group in honor of the, the First Nation, uh, the Apache Nation. And the idea behind it is that let's coordinate our efforts. You know, we all have uh, fixes, improvements, patches, uh, wisdom and experience associated with this. Uh, luckily, this is uh, NCSA was, uh, was licensed in a way that we could just take it on again and relicense it under another permissive license as well. Why don't we just do this? And it started off as the concept of a mailing list. And I think what's important to remember at this particular period of time is that it kind of serves as sort of like the impetus or an insight uh, into a lot of the reasons or the rationales behind the Apache way and the way uh, Apache and Apache projects are governed. You know, for example, the Apache group started off because there was a uh, an open source project that uh, was really dependent on one person. And once they went away, it left people really in a bad situation. And it showed the importance of having not only a really good, healthy, and viable uh, user community, but also a contributor community as well. Uh, we certainly didn't want anyone to be in the situation that we found ourselves in back then. So you'll see in a lot of situations, that idea uh, behind creating healthy communities around an open source project is because of that, that first cut that we got. You know, we wanted to make sure that no one else was put in that exact same situation. Uh, and you also notice that one of the best ways of doing that was creating a, a mailing list. And that even right now, till today, we have this, this fascination with, uh, with email lists inside there. Now, it didn't take very, very long before a number of those patches put together uh, and the Apache group actually released the first official public release it was 0 0.6.2. Uh, it was done on April's Fool's Day in 1995. And that was really the first time that the world became uh, aware of this, uh, the Apache web server out there. Now, also right around this time, uh, the NCSA web server tried to, uh, to reboot. And there was a period of cooperation between NCSA and, uh, and the Apache web server uh, as well with some sharing code and things of that nature. But that stopped uh, a little bit after this period of time because there was a lot of internal redesign, re-architecturing going on inside of the Apache web server. Back then, uh, this was considered very, very similar to a traditional Unix daemon. You know, as a request came in, a process was forked off, uh, the process was requested, and the process went away. Um, and that was really not, uh, not long-term tenable, wasn't very scalable, wasn't very efficient. And there was this, uh, this brainstorm, this, uh, this, uh, this proof of concept from RST um, called Shambhala. Uh, which really took that uh, that initial Apache web server and really re-architected it into this pre fork scenario with a modular nature, with the idea of memory pools and a, uh, a, a really well-defined uh, API such that you could add functionality onto at the end of it. And once that started happening, it became much more difficult for architectural reasons for, uh, for NCSA and, and the Apache group to start sharing these patches back and forth. Um, and it was really the, the major thing that I think leapfrog Apache over any other uh, web server out there was the, the modular nature the high performance associated with it, the focus on community. And it was only uh, you know a few months later on at the end of the year, well, close to the end of the year in 1995, that we did release Apache 1.0. And that included basically all this major re-architecting and things like that. 
Uh, and if you start looking at the, uh, the surveys from that point of time, it did not take long for Apache to become the number one web server out there. Even though we weren't looking for market share, we weren't focused on market share and things of that nature, just the, the, the open source nature of it, the community nature of it, and certainly the modular aspect associated with it, that you could add functionality without knowing the deep internal guts and core of the Apache web server was a key factor in its importance. Uh, several years later after that, we released Apache 1.3 that included, uh, you know, being able to uh, load in modules via shared object libraries instead of having to pre-compile them into one large monolith. You can just pick and choose which modules you wanted uh, and pull them in the same way as you did shared libraries. Another key factor in this was modifying the architecture to include other operating systems. Now, we had always been focused basically on Linux or Unix-like operating systems. So I was working for, uh, for SunOS, Solaris, Linux, BSD. What got me involved in the very beginning was I wanted to port it to a version of Apache of, of Apple, a Unix called AUX, which was a, a hybrid. But 1.3 actually included support for Windows, the Windows 95 system, which was a major undertaking at the time. And if you actually looked at the code back then, it was littered with a series of if defs and if defines and stuff like that, breaking things off, you know, with architectural that, you know, if you're running Windows, this is what you want to do. If you're running Unix or anything else, do like that. So even though it worked and worked really, really well when we expanded our horizons, we knew that we needed to architecture that differently later on. In 1998, we had our first uh, first uh, a semi-official uh, Apache Con um, in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, that is a picture of some of the people from the, uh, the Apache group who were available and attending that session. And we had our first official ASF um, back in the next year after we actually incorporated. So June 1st, 1999 is when we um, sort of like put on our big folks pants and incorporated as a uh, 501c3, which is a nonprofit designation, uh, a Delaware based corporation called the Apache Software Foundation. And kudos for IBM for helping us uh, do that. They were very, very helpful, provided uh, you know, a large part of the incentive for doing it because basically IBM wanted to use uh, Apache HTTPD as part of their web sphere. Uh, and they were somewhat concerned about the legal intricacies uh, of that regarding licensing and stuff like that. But we also realized that the pair, you know, at that point in time with Apache becoming much more successful, you know, all of us within the Apache group liked having roofs over our head. And we realized that, you know, uh, people being, uh, you know, somewhat, um, you know, uh, prone to uh, legal suits and stuff like that. We wanted to protect ourselves, protect our IP. And so the Apache Software Foundation came into being in 1999. And that's when we had our first official uh, US uh, Apache Con in Florida and our first European conference in London was, uh, was in year 2000. As I mentioned before, we needed to do a lot of re-architecting in, inside of Apache HTTPD. And we figured what we'll do is take all these ugly um, platform dependencies and spin that out into its own separate uh, library. Uh, we originally looked at the Netscape uh, uh, portable runtime library to sort of like be that uh, compatibility layer in the same way the POSIX is sort of like a compatibility layer. But there were licensing concerns with that. So we created uh, APR, the Apache uh, runtime a library to basically fill that need for it. And that was one of the major decisions, one of the major features on Apache 2.0, including uh, multiple operation modules. Uh, we moved away from the pre fork scenario and added other capabilities such as a worker or a threaded mode inside there. Uh, we uh, included and bundled SSL inside of there which was really possible once the RSA patent ran out. You may remember that previous to this time, uh, you really, really couldn't use SSL in the US without um, you know, uh, the, uh, the RSA license getting inside there. And a number of companies got their start by providing shrink wrap versions of SSL modules uh, using RSA's uh, compatibility library. 
Uh, but we were able to actually include this now in Apache 2.0 and improved a lot of other capability as well. Uh, you know, named virtual host, IO layering, filtering, a lot of capabilities inside there. Um, and then about three years later, we came out with Apache 2.2 which uh, again, really emphasized the idea of pulling this into there, uh, making full use of, uh, of APR. Um, at that point in time, it was really viable. It was able to, to be able to, uh, to be included inside there. Um, and we also had the idea that not only could Apache be a web server, it could also implement other technologies. So uh, and it, for example, there was an FTP module that allowed your Apache web server to run FTP, run SMTP, run Telnet, run IMAP. So it became almost sort of like a protocol server rather than just a, a web server out there. And that was, again, one of the key features of Apache 2.2. Um, and then several years later, we came out with Apache 2.4, which has a ton of improvements out there. Uh, asynchronous I.O., uh, event-based uh, processing, an incredibly uh, robust reverse proxy mechanism with dynamic health checks. Um, and then we actually supported under the 2.4 uh, umbrella, uh, HTTP2, you know, the next, uh, well, at the time, which was the next major version of the uh, HTTP uh, network protocol. Now, you may think that no other development has been going on inside there. We are still under the 2.4 uh, version number. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're stagnant. Uh, I saw something, someone uh, chat something on the uh, uh, on the HTTP Slack channel uh, for, for hop in, if whether or not we're still developing. Uh, we are up to 2449, I think. And almost every other patch level includes a new features, new capabilities. And the reason why we're kind of hesitant to bump up to 26 or 30 is because that breaks backward ABI, you know, and because there is this huge, healthy, viable module, um, you know, module community out there. If you break that, you either require them to, at the very, very least, rebuild those modules, but most probably redesign them to attract the new ABI. And we figured out that we've been able to really add as much as we want to, almost as much as we want to, keeping the same ABI there. So again, we've got a long future ahead of us. We are moving like crazy, active development going on, and we encourage anyone to, to use it, but also, send us your patches at the very, very first was all about driving the community together to improve it. We haven't deviated from that one iota. Thank you, Jim. That was really wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, history of the HTTPD uh, project. And this timeline is available on GitHub. Uh, I shared the link above, uh, Brian asked, so, and it's also available on the slides. And right now it's currently on GitHub, but we want to make it easier for organizations, projects, companies, individuals to share their own timeline, uh, to share their own, their own open source stories. And I want to talk now about opensource.net. This, uh, this is a website that was launched by OSI during our anniversary to celebrate uh, the 20 years of open source. And right now, if you go to the website, opensource.net, you'll see that we're still celebrating the 20 years of open source, but we want to relaunch that. And our goal is to help uh, everyone to share their own timelines, their own stories. And that, uh, that exercise, creating the Apache timeline is part of that. Uh, we're working to, to see what kind of uh, user interface we'll, we'll be able to use uh, to help people share their stories. Uh, so uh, who, who, uh, we're going to be releasing that early next year, uh, we're January 2021. Uh, we're opening for beta in November this year. And our target audience is organizations like the Apache and all the projects that are under Apache or any other organization. Companies who would also like to share their open source stories and timelines. And of course, individuals, members of the open source community. And one of the features that we're working on 
is to have a side-by-side -side timeline. So, for example, uh, there are a lot of uh, members here from the Apache, the Apache group. And if you want to share your story, uh, and not just a, a single timeline, but show how your, your personal timeline matches that one from the Apache Software Foundation, you can do that. So you'll be able to see two timelines one to the left, one to the right, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, add your own milestones easily, uh, very fr friendly, and just mix it up. And we also make it available API for those timelines. So if we wanted to have this, those timelines showing up, not just at opensource.net, but also at other organizations, like the Apache Software Foundation on their apache.org website or the Linux Foundation. Since next year, we'll be celebrating the 30 years of, of Linux. If the Linux Foundation wants to show their timeline, we're uh, developing an open API as well. Uh, so they can pull the data, uh, not only uh, for the Linux timeline, but also for individuals' timelines. And so this is all part of the future work that we're working to develop. And we'll be sharing that next year. And uh, we're open to suggestions. Basically, the user interface that we'll be using are the ones uh, similar to the, the Apache timeline that I shared with you. And Jim uh, was able to share uh, that story with us. And we're open to comments, uh, suggestions. Uh, regarding the, the user interface. And also, uh, if you want to uh, add um, changes to the Apache timeline, if you would like to add your own project, if you are a leader of a Apache project and you like to add your own timeline and work with us to, uh, to add your timeline to opensource.net, uh, I'll be able to help you. And I guess we have like uh, about seven minutes for questions. If you like to, to ask both me uh, about opensource.net, about the timeline, or Tim about the history of uh, Apache, uh, we're here available to answer any questions for you. I'll load my video, let's see uh, if the bandwidth works. <laughs> If anybody has a question, Apache, do you? <laughs> I appreciate the uh, healthy chat in the uh, in the chat screen. That was very, very cool. A lot of uh, good history inside there. Mm -hmm. So the timeline uh, right now, it's on GitHub. It's very, it's open source, of course. And if you want to uh, submit any changes there, I'll be happy to do that. And we'll be integrating that to opensource.net. We're still using Drupal, yes. And so we have Drupal on the back end. And the user interface is just uh, plain uh, vanilla JavaScript and HTML mostly. So Michael, uh, what's the Apache Nation? Uh, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, I think Michael's most probably referring to the uh, the source, the heritage, the origin of the choice of the word uh, Apache uh, for the Apache group and the Apache Software Foundation, and initially for the name of the server itself. Um, in fact, there's actually a blog post on um, the, the ASF uh, site, uh, which goes into the history behind it. But uh, we just wanted to, you know, certainly reaffirm that, you know, the, the, the idea behind it is that there was a, a lot of respect and honor in the, the First Nation, Apache Nation, uh, their, their focus on community, um, the way they organized their leadership uh, structure, 
Uh, and that's really was the the source of it. It wasn't until later on that we kind of grokked onto the facts that, oh, Apache. Well, another way of looking at it is that <laughs> the web server is full of patches. So it's sort of like a patchy web server. But we wanted to make that clear. We want to yeah. make that uh, <laughs> clarified. So that was it. Yeah. Nice. So uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining. Jim, thank you so much for the overview of the history. That was really thank exciting. You, uh, uh, we'll have a lot of work to get opensource.net uh, available to as a, a service for all open source projects. Certainly, Apache, uh, you're welcome to, to add your own timelines here. And, and I hope you enjoy it. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of ApacheCon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers, all.